Hello and welcome to Brooks TV News. I'm Huma Gori. And I'm Stuart Turner. Phase one of the Gypsy Lane campus redevelopment is now complete. So we sent Jordan Hudson into the new Space to Think building to have a look around. Space to Think is the title of the new campus development at Gypsy Lane campus of Oxford Brooks. The university has been rated as the top modern university for 10 years running and so it has been decided that its main campus should complement the university's reputation for its standards of teaching and research. Richard Sills explained to us the development still to come. When you're in the forum, forum space, you'll effectively be able to look up and see the lecture theatre kind of hanging, hang, over. hanging over you, yeah, definitely. But how will this benefit the students? We've got the teaching block, so this is the, the, the big teaching block. 80% of all of this new build is dedicated towards teaching and learning. I spoke to some students who have been using the building already. Uh, and it's a really great space to work in. I think this building is amazing because it's open and you can walk and see other people. However, with a total investment of £132 million, it's surprising that such a fundamental issue has been somewhat neglected. Acoustics. The interior building materials in this space have been used due to their ecologically beneficial properties, which is the primary concern in many new buildings. However, these materials are variants of glass, wood, metal and stone, which are big reflectors of sound. This means that multiple lectures being carried out in the same open space interfere with each other and are causing trouble for students. Charles Parrock, senior lecturer in architecture, asked Geoffrey Palmer about the consideration of acoustics. What about what did you have to do to, to get that naturally ventilated space but, but minimise any acoustic... Um... Because we got the exposed thermal mass, which is great for low energy, but it's not good for noise because the noise all bounces around. It's really reverberant. It can't be absorbed. So we've got the vertical absorptive, absorptive panels within the ceiling design to absorb some of that reverberant noise. Charles Parrock also sent an email to Brooks TV News stating it's more about identifying activities that would be disrupted by certain noise levels. Once these activities have been identified, then measures can be taken to prevent the noise being disruptive. I caught up with a student who is having issues with the building's acoustics. Acoustic qualities of the building aren't that great. You can hear everything that's going on in the atrium, which is sometimes a bit disturbing. Richard Sills gave this explanation. The high ceilings in, in some of the, um, in the teaching rooms should also help noise travel. A lot of the acoustic work doesn't push out too much noise, um, so the big, the big thick walls will block, block quite a lot of noise. I asked him how the architectural team feel about the resulting build. I think the architects, the design team are very proud of, proud of what they've done. With mixed feelings about the new building, it sounds like compromises have been made. Once the project is complete, it will become clear as to whether the pros outweigh the cons. Jordan Hudson, BTV News. As Oxford Brooks continues to develop space to think, there are still several issues that students feel are being ignored. One of those problems is the parking situation just outside Wheatley campus, James Sheldon reports. Walter Perry Road is located outside the main entrance to Wheatley campus. For many years students have parked their cars along the banks of this road, causing concern for drivers and students' safety. One of the reasons for this is because of the fact it's unclear what needs to be done to resolve the issue, and by who. As students aren't illegally parking, I spoke to the district councillor to find out why parking on Walter Perry Road is causing such issues. If you're overtaking and you're overtaking and there's nowhere to get back in, somebody comes from the other direction, they don't realise how much parking there is and you can be head on with nowhere to go. So really the, the issue is whose job it is to resolve this situation. With the councillor not knowing who is responsible for fixing the current situation, I spoke to Oxford Brooks, Director of Corporate Affairs, to find out their concerns. Oxford Brooks University really takes very seriously the issues of parking around the campus in Wheatley. Um, we, like the residents, are concerned about safety. After listening to both the council and the university, I went on to find out how local residents would like the issue resolved. The problem at the moment is putting people at risk and in danger. 
So I think putting double yellow lines there and moving the problem to somewhere less dangerous might be quite sensible. So how do the university and the council feel about adding double yellow lines? We put a lot of effort into raising awareness of alternative modes of transport and we would be very supportive of any proposals to put double yellow lines down Waterpoe Road. The problem with the parking up here, if we put double yellow lines, it would just displace it somewhere else. So there are mixed opinions on double yellow lines as well as other issues. But what did the students think about parking at Water Perry Road? Unless there's a kind of an alternative solution, I think it's going to be everyone's just going to park there from, for the foreseeable future. Say that it is more convenient to drive than it is to get the Brooks bus. Um, it saves you a lot of time um, and it saves you a lot of hassle really. So yeah. With some students not looking for alternative transport anytime soon, what advice can the council give? I don't want to say there's an accident waiting to happen, I don't like those words, but I think anybody that's seen it must be concerned that there's more that, that can be done. One thing I would say, absolutely sort of directly to students if they're watching this, is please be careful when you're going back to your car. After speaking to the District Council and Oxford Brooks University, there has been evidence of attempts to try and resolve this issue. However, it seems those who are looking for a fast solution will be disappointed, as the way forward seems unclear. James Sheldon, Brooks TV. The Phoenix Cinema in Oxford is celebrating its 100th birthday. Jordan Hudson went along to see what they're getting up to. The Phoenix Picture House Cinema, located on Walton Street in Jericho, will be celebrating its 100th anniversary since its opening as the North Oxford Kinema in March 1913. With the decline of the European economy and with video piracy threatening the UK film industry, it's great to see that this particular cinema has been such a success. As it's the oldest cinema in all of Oxfordshire and just three years younger than the oldest one in Britain, I'm here to find out what all the fuss is about. Whilst the cinema wasn't the first to open in Oxford, it's the only one to stay open and functioning as a cinema until present day. We are um, celebrating uh, how long the cinema's been open. It's been open since 1913 and we're putting together a book of all the kind of memories of customers and staff that have worked here. Basically, uh, it's pretty much all year that we'll be celebrating. We've got all the late shows back, uh, so we're bringing kind of classic films and cult films back. So. Um, yeah, they're going to be every Saturday night. Since it was renamed as the Scala in 1920, the Phoenix specialised in the screening of old and foreign films until the end of the 60s. Following another change of ownership in 1977, it was renamed the Phoenix Cinema and in 1989 it became the first cinema to be owned and run by the newly formed company City Screen Limited, which is now better known as the Picture House Cinema chain. Yes, occasionally I, I come here and play in exchange for a cinema ticket and sometimes I just come here and play for fun. As far as it being 100 years old, that's marvellous it's, and it's good that a few of them are still surviving. Let's hope it's here in another 100 years' time. We've seen how the local community get involved with the Phoenix Cinema. Stuart, the general manager, gave his projection of the cinema's future. Yeah, we've got a lot of things uh, planned. I mean, the main uh, sort of thrust of the cinema is that it's a community cinema. And uh, one of our targets to incorporate the 100th birthday is to appeal to all, all parts of the community. So we've launched what's called a toddler time club, which is for mums and dads with their children aged one to five. We're very much hoping that the students will come and, and visit us during the, uh, the celebrations. Despite the various challenges faced over the last century, the Phoenix is still standing and is still thriving today. As a cinema with a story, character and plenty to offer, it seems the Phoenix Picture House will continue to be successful for years to come. Jordan Hudson, BTV News. Tuition fees are on the rise, and that means online degrees are more popular than ever. So are they the future of higher education? Technology now allows us to communicate in more ways than before, through internet and other resources online. Are universities adapting to these changes to benefit students? We asked a student that has completed an online degree his opinion. I have done an online degree. Um, I did it in 2006, if I'm correct. I, well, the online degree was actually um, done by the University of Wales 
in Lampita. The benefits of it is that it's cheap, it's hassle-free, and tutors are there like a click of a finger. It's the best way to, you know, do a degree, I think, um, especially a person like me who has, you know, other priorities and responsibilities. So if you have those, then online degree is the best. I do feel like every um, teenager does want the university experience, so I'll kind of be iffy about it. I'm a little bit um, sceptical of the facilities that online degrees can offer. With more people wanting to gain higher education, whilst working or fitting it in around other commitments, an online degree seems the best solution. However, are there some courses that only seem possible in a physical institution? Oxford Brooks has a high reputation in skills-based courses. Oxford Brooks is meant to be ranked among the top three in the UK when it comes to engineering, especially in motorsports engineering, it's meant to be one of the top two. An online degree would definitely not suit this kind of course. For a course like motorsports, I think it's essential that you get all this uh, equipment and you know very highly subsidised. You know, you need the lab time. You need to be able to spend time working with the stuff, and you actually need proper time with the teachers and lecturers because it's not straightforward work. In a recent experiment, Stanford University attracted the interest of over 336,000 people from over 190 countries by offering three free online courses. Distance learning has been available in the UK for years, but how many people are interested in this type of course? It's all down to whether the resources and the information is just as good as it would be in a standard university. If I knew about online degrees, it would have been beneficial to do that instead of going to uni full time for money purposes. I wouldn't have looked at online degrees just because I wanted the university experience and I wanted to do it full time. I wouldn't do an online degree because uh, I want to study a hands-on subject, but I support single mums doing online degrees or people that can't get to an institute. With online degrees increasing in popularity, will Oxford Brooks struggle to fill its courses? This is Grant Reddings for Brooks TV News. And after the break, we speak to John Twycross, a lecturer from Oxford Brooks. We'll be finding out if he thinks universities face serious competition from online courses. See you soon. Welcome back. Now, as we mentioned, we have John Twycross in the studio to give his opinion about online degrees. John, welcome. Hi. So, do you think that online degrees will become the future of higher education? Um, I think there will be a lot more online content for degrees, but I'm not sure that online degrees will take over um, per se. What we do here is we, we really look at blended learning, which is using a range of activities for, for teaching. And this not only helps students because people learn in different ways, but also it kind of just helps um, engage people just who wouldn't normally engage through other, other means. For example, people learn better through video sometimes than, than looking at books. And there's a lot of opportunity for universities there. Um, and of course, what, what people talk about a lot is online degrees. And what we have to remember is that actually a university has to give a degree. You can't get a degree without a university. So the universities will actually be behind that. So there is a lot of opportunities for universities in that. Sure. So what you're really saying is that online degrees as such will not be the, the future of higher education, but they will be a big part of it. Yes, it already is a big part. I mean, for example, we have distance learning courses at Oxford Brookes, um, particularly in um, healthcare. And I think some of the mechanical, mechanical engineers actually have a, online courses. But that's really for people who, who haven't got the time and can't commit to being here full time. If you can come here full time, then what you get from that are all the facilities you wouldn't get at home. For example, the TV studio we're in now, um, we've got a 12 camera motion capture suite, which is great. Um, and that's actually what got me to come here. If they didn't have these facilities, I probably wouldn't be here. The students possibly wouldn't come. Um, so it's, it's keeping a balance of what they need to give that extra experience to students and kind of weighing that up um, with all the other factors. So you, you think the, the university experience is something valuable and something that will never be replaced? Um, yeah, you can't say never be replaced. It's always changing and we are in a, a time of extreme change for higher education and, and a lot of challenges ahead. But um, I think there, there's nothing, nothing better 
than actually talking in a class, actually um, engaging with people, engaging with your peers who you'll probably go on to work with and you'll know for at least the next 10 years, if not the rest of your life. Um, and making those connections and, and doing it solidly in person over three years is, is really a, an amazing thing. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot more to university than just getting a certificate. There's, there is the whole process and you grow as a person. I completely agree with you. Um, do you think if there were a lot more pure online degrees that they maybe wouldn't do so well, do so well because of that? Do you, um, do you think they're as valuable and that the, the qualifications are as credible as, as a proper degree? Well, I think whoever's behind the degree, for example, you could do an online degree um, from Harvard University. I mean, I think that, that probably would have credibility, um, whereas another university may, may not have that same credibility. Um, but the fact that a lot of these Ivy League places and, I mean, within the university here, people are investigating ways of, of working with it, and no one really knows where it's going to go. And this is the exciting thing about universities is, I mean, especially in certain subjects, we don't know where that subject's going to lead. I mean, media technology is so cutting edge and so changing so rapidly that I don't know what I'll be teaching in five years' time. Um, it's the same with the environment that we'll be teaching in. Um, we don't know what the next thing, like an iPad, is going to be. Um, we don't know the full impact of everybody in the university having an iPad. What's it, what's it going to do? What's it going to change? Are we going to have all the rooms that are full of computer labs now, are they going to be stripped out because we don't need them, because everyone will have their own very powerful PCs in their pocket? Um, who knows? Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining for us. That was very interesting. After a year on the airwaves, Brooks Radio has moved to brand new, much bigger studios on the Headington Hill campus. John Glasgow reports. So next up we've got Ben Howard and we've also got Feeder which just... Brooks Radio recently moved into a brand new studio at the Headington Hill campus. So I caught up with the station's manager to find out about the move and how it will affect them. Brooks Radio started live at least uh, about a year ago and at that time we were in pretty much a cupboard under the stairs at Wheatley campus but you could only fit a couple of people in there and it wasn't the best location. So then we moved to a disused office in Wheatley which was a lot better, it was clean and there was a window so people could just, like see what was happening uh, but still it was all that you know all those miles away. So now with lots of help from the SU we've managed to secure this amazing room which has two basically window walls so everyone can see what's happening in here and it's a massive space so we can have guests in and it's just it's such a fabulous place to be. The radio station could be a vital part of the community at Brooks. So this is a great way um, and a very accessible way for students to, uh, to be able to engage with one another. So I went to find out how many students have heard of Brooks Radio or about the move. No, barely. Well, I know it. I, I do I know, know it exists. exists. We haven't really heard of Brooks Radio. I've never listened to it. I'm sorry. I didn't know there was one. I hadn't heard about the move, no. I'd heard of the station, but not much about the move. Being here will help our profile so much because some people didn't even know that Brooks Radio existed. I mean, the majority of students didn't know that we existed. And it just makes people want to get involved either presenting or just simply listening. The DJs will no doubt be excited about the prospect of having more listeners. Yeah, the move's been really great. Um, and I think it's really going to help us and uh, get us more noticed, especially with our big sticker that we have outside the window. Um, a lot more students are going to notice us now and... Yeah, it's, I think it's really exciting. So uh, it's quite nice to have the little kind of sofa area and the mood lighting and all the kind of things like that to make it look so cool. If you're passing by, give Brooks Radio a wave. John Glasgow, Brooks TV News. It's absolutely great to hear they've settled in. For more information, visit them at brooksradio.com. Now, spring is just around the corner, so Lark Rice Primary School have started rehearsals for the annual Oxford Carnival. Brooks TV joined them to get into the party atmosphere. The Lark Rice Samba Club is an after school activity for school children aged 7 to 11 years old. I spoke to the Samba Band's organiser to see how it all got started. Well, we got a big pot of money uh, a few years ago to spend on music and we decided to uh, spend it all in one big go on a whole lot of samba instruments. 
which we got. Uh, for a while we were in talk by a semi-professional samba player, but she unfortunately got a job in Nicaragua, so I ended up having to do that job, and I've been doing it for six years, I think. And it started, oh, is it six, seven years ago now. They love it. I mean, some of them will drop out, because it's not quite their thing, but the majority will stick with it, and uh, for when they put it on the street or when they put it in front of an audience, then it's magic. <laughs> It's clear that early preparations have been made to get the band geared up for this summer's carnival. And I'm sure it'll be a success for the children of Lark Rice Primary School. This is Grant Reddings for Brooks TV News. Oh, that looks exciting. I wish my, my primary school had a samba band. Anyway, I hope to, um, I look forward to seeing them at the Oxford Carnival. Now sports. Oxford Brooks recently played Oxford University in the annual varsity football match. The game had flashes of inspiration while the crowd provided ent entertainment and motivation for both teams. BTV Sport were there to capture the highlights. The previous varsity games have always been a worthy note on the calendar and this game proved to be no different. From the start, Oxford University hit the ground running, scoring a well-executed goal in the first three minutes. Oxford were taking no prisoners after scoring from a corner kick just over ten minutes after their first. A defending disaster from Brooks caused them to concede a third goal. It seemed like it was going to be a long night for the Greens. Oxford kept on the pressure, making the Brooks defenders work really hard. However, the nightmare continued, with Oxford scoring their fourth goal in 30 minutes. An answer from Brooks finally came with a well-executed header from a free kick, making it 4-1 at half-time. The fans were over the moon. Tables started to turn in the second half, with Brooks converting a penalty to make it 4-2. Oxford and Brooks were given a much-needed lifeline as Oxford University had their fifth goal disallowed due to offside. However, the comeback was short-lived, with Oxford scoring the final goal of the game to make it 5-2 at full time. I think the match went, we, we didn't start well, I think that's fair to say. Uh, we came out the blocks and they were the better team from the start. The first half hour played really well, came out the blocks excellently, 4-0 up. Um, it was always a danger we might switch off. Uh, and after we hit the bar a couple of times, the last 15 minutes they came back into it um, and got the goal. But um, yeah, it was really nice playing in front of a, a good crowd, like good atmosphere. And yeah, it helped make it a good game to play. Oxford Brooks showed that they were not going to go down easily. However, it was safe to say the best team won. James Sean, Brooks TV News. What a brilliant game. Yeah, it's a shame we lost. With the new year comes new adventures, so who better to have a go at the latest river craze than our reporter, Edward Packham. River surfing is coming to Oxfordshire after gaining popularity in Germany, New Zealand and North America. Hi, I'm Ed Packham in Abingdon in February, river surfing with the only person in England to do so. This kind of river surfing is caused by a high volume of water rushing over an object to create a wave. I talked to Dave Adams to find out more about it. Uh, first people to actually surf a wave on a river um, were the Americans, yeah, in Colorado, around there, and they're quite big on it in Germany as well. How many years have you been river surfing? Uh, uh, actually river surfing, only about two, two and a bit years, I think. Would you advise anyone to turn up and just go um, river surfing? Probably um, not at the moment. With Dave making it look so easy, I decided to give it a go. There are several health and safety issues to river surfing, such as getting caught up on something, hitting your head, and in this case, hypothermia. So make sure you have an expert at hand if you're inexperienced. However, my lack of experience started to show, so I left it to the expert. Well, that was cold but fun. I wouldn't recommend doing that in winter. This is Ed Packham for Brooks TV News. So that's it for this show. Remember, you can view all the previous episodes online by going to btv.brooks.ac.uk. We also want to hear about what's happening near you, so please email your stories or questions to brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Goodbye.